Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome to lecture 15 of the course on multivariate data mining methods and applications. The title of this lecture is sample PCA and applications. In the last lecture, we have discussed the interpretation of principal component analysis using least square criterion and the variance maximization criterion. In practice, you have to estimate the eigenvalues and eigenvectors and they are from the principal components on the basis of sample observations. So, in this lecture, we are going to consider the estimation problem the estimation of principal components on the basis of sample observations. We are also going to discuss some of the examples, numerical examples which have been solved using our software and the interpretations of the outcome which you get from the R software. Now, first we consider sample principal components. Say so, suppose x i i equal to 1 to n are n independent observations on x's. Each of these observations is a r cross 1 vector means observation vector on r variables. Then you can estimate mu x by the sample mean x bar. So, you take mu head x equal to x bar which is equal to 1 upon n summation i equal to 1 to n x i. So, obviously, x bar is also r cross 1 vector. Then, suppose x c i is equal to x i minus x bar for i equal to 1 to n. So, x c i's are the centered values. The values are taken as deviation from mean and then you can form r cross n matrix of centered observations say x c equal to x c 1, x c 2, so on x c n. This is r cross n matrix. Then an estimate of sigma x x is 1 upon n x c x c transpose and then we write x c x c transpose equal to s. So, you get sigma head x x equal to n inverse s. Then, just we are estimating sigma x x by sigma head x x and then we estimate the eigenvalues of sigma x x by the eigenvalues of sigma x x head. So, suppose lambda 1 head greater than or equal to lambda 2 head, so on greater than or equal to lambda r head greater than or equal to 0, these are the ordered eigenvalues of sigma x x head. Then v j head is the sample eigenvector associated with lambda j head, j equal to 1 to r. Now, we are considering t rank approximation. So, what is a t? a t is equal to v 1, v 2, v t and this is equal to 
B T transpose. So, in this expression for A T, we simply replace V 1, V 2, so on V T by their estimators. We replace V 1 by V 1 head, V 2 by V 2 head, so on V T by V T head. So, this gives you an estimate of A T or B hat T transpose. Then best rank T reconstruction of X is say on the basis of your sample, you are estimating the eigenvectors and eigenvalues of sigma x x and therefrom you are estimating A, B and then you can estimate C also where C is equal to A, B. So, you get x hat t equal to x bar, you have estimated mu x by x bar, c hat t x minus x bar, where c hat t is equal to a t hat b t hat, which is equal to summation j equal to 1 to t v j had v j had transpose. Then using v j had you can get the j -th sample principal component score of x which is psi j had equal to v j had transpose x c. Then you also need a sample estimate of measure of how well the first t principal components represent the r original variables. And the estimate of this measure is lambda t plus 1 hat so plus so on lambda r hat divided by lambda 1 hat plus so on plus lambda r hat. So, remember that in the original measure we had taken lambda t plus 1 plus so on plus lambda r divided by lambda 1 plus so on plus lambda r and uh, here we have simply replaced these lambdas by their estimators to obtain this measure. So, this measure gives you the proportion of total sample variation that is explained by the last r minus t sample principal components and this is the amount of loss of information divided by the total information contained in the sample. Then covariance and correlation matrix principal component analysis. Then uh, so far we have considered the principal components which are presented as linear combinations of centered original values. Uh, so, these are the principal components which are based on covariances. The principal components based on the covariance matrix will change with units of measurements. So, if you change the unit of measurement, then the principal components will also change because covariance depends upon the units of measurement, which is not a desirable feature. So, sometimes we do not want our principal components to change with units. So, in that case an alternative is to standardize the variables. You subtract the mean to center it and then you divide it by the standard deviation. So, that its variance becomes 1. So, this is the process of standardizing the variables. X i is centered and divided by S i, where S i is the standard deviation of n observations of ith variable. And then you define z i equal to S i inverse x c i. You have centered x i is, so x i minus x bar is your x c i and then you have divided it by S i to get z i. Then we replace uh, these 
original x values by the standardized data matrix say z. Then the covariance matrix of z is actually the correlation matrix of x because you have divided by the standard deviations. So, covariances become correlations between x's and suppose you denote the correlation matrix by R. Then the principal component analysis of this standardized data is called a correlation matrix principal component analysis. And the beauty of this correlation matrix principal component analysis is that it is invariant to linear changes in units of measurement. So, the principal components do not change when you change the units of measurement, it is invariant to such changes. Then, obviously, the correlation matrix principal components are different from the covariance matrix principal components. And ultimately, whether you should go for correlation matrix principal components or covariance matrix principal components, it depends upon your problem. Whether you are interested in making your principal components invariant to units of measurements or not, or whether units of measurements are important for your analysis or not. So, ultimately it depends upon what are your objectives. Now, trace of r is equal to a small r. Remember that in the correlation matrix all the diagonal elements are 1, 1, 1, so on, 1. Off diagonal elements give you the correlations. So, if you take the sum of all these diagonal elements, then the sum is equal to the number of components that is r. Now, proportion of total variance accounted for is the variance of principal component divided by r. So, for a particular principal component, if you divide the values of the principal component by r, then this gives you the proportion of total values accounted for that particular principal component. Uh, PCA one can also use for multi dimensional scaling. Uh, actually, the purpose of multi dimensional scaling is to display multi dimensional data in two dimension. So, what we do? We go for the principal component analysis, then we consider just first two principal components and then you may display the multi dimensional data using these first two principal components. So, you can make use of principal component analysis for multi dimensional scaling. Another problem is how many principal components to retain. So, to decide the number of principal components to retain, we can make use of a scree plot, which is the plot of ordered eigenvalues against ordered numbers. Actually, these eigenvalues show the amount of variance explained by that particular principal component. So, when we plot ordered eigenvalues against the corresponding numbers, then it is actually the plot of amount of variance explained by each eigenvalue. So, in one of the previous lectures, we discussed the principal component analysis of Irish 
data. So, here is the scree plot for Irish data. So, the first principal component, this is the eigenvalue corresponding to the first principal component. So, first principal component explains this much of variation, the second principal component explains this much of variation and so on. Then another plot which you can use for deciding the number of principal components is P c rank trace. So, suppose k is the number of principal components retained and r is the total number of principal components. Then delta c hat k is equal to 1 minus k upon r to the power half. We define delta c hat k equal to 1 minus k upon r to the power half and then delta sigma k is equal to lambda k plus 1 square plus 1 plus lambda r square divided by lambda 1 square plus 1 lambda r square to the power half. And then P c rank trace plot is the plot of delta sigma k against delta c hat k. In both of these plots, scree plot and P c rank trace plot, k is chosen as a small positive integer between 1 and r at which an elbow can be detected in principal component rank trace plot or scree plot, where you get an elbow. Say so, suppose this is the plot and after that so you can say here is a an elbow or here is an elbow. So, you may choose say three principal components. So, k is chosen as the smallest positive integer between 1 and r at which you get an elbow. Now, we consider the data set decathlon to from facto extra package of R. And in this data set, athletes performance during two sporting events has been taken into consideration. There are 27 individuals or athletes described by 13 variables sports disciplines, but for the principal component analysis just first 23 active individuals are taken and then we have taken just first 10 active variables or first 10 active sports. So, this is a brief display of some part of the data set. You have 10 variables as 100 meters race, long jump, short put, high jump, 400 meters, then uh, uh, 100 meter hurdle, discus throw, pole vault, javelin throw and 1500 meter race and uh, these are different players. So, first uh, 6 players in all we have taken 23 players, 23 active individuals for the principal component analysis, but these are observations for just first 6 players. Then we have performed the principal component analysis for this data set.
So, for the first principal component, this is the vector of coefficients, you can say b 1, the coefficient associated with 100 meter is uh, around minus 0 0.42, then long jump it is 0.39, corresponding to short put it is 0 0.36 and so on. Then you have coefficients corresponding to principal component 2, 3, 4 and so on. So, we consider all the 10 possible principal components here. Now, we see how these principal components perform. So, the first row gives you the standard deviations corresponding to these 10 principal components. So, corresponding to the first principal component it is 2.0308, then you have 1.3559, then it gradually decreases 1.1132.90523 and so on. Then uh, we consider the proportion of variance explained by all these principal components. The first principal component explains 0 0.4124 proportion of variance. So, around 41 percent variance has been explained by the first principal component. Then the second principal component has explained around 0 0.18 or 18 percent variation. The third row gives you the cumulative proportion. So, so if you add 0 0.4124 and 0 0.1839, you get 0 0.5963. So, if you consider the first two principal components, the first two principal components combined explain around 59.63 percent of total variation. So, just using the first two principal components, you are able to capture around 59.63 percent information of the total information available in the sample. Then the third principal component is able to capture 0 0.1239 proportion of variance. So, if you consider the cumulative proportion on the basis of first three principal components, you are able to capture slightly more than 72 percent of the total information. Similarly, the proportion of variance corresponding to fourth principal component is just 0 0.08194 and if you take the combined variance or cumulative proportion of variance for first four principal components, it is 0 0.80 or you are able to explain 80 percent of the information if you consider first four principal components. Similarly, if you consider first five principal components, you are able to capture 87 percent or more slightly more than 87 percent of the total information. As soon as you incorporate principal component 6, you are able to capture 91 percent or more than 91 percent of the total information and so on. If you include all the 10 principal components, you are able to capture the entire 100 percent information. So, just uh, suppose you focus on first four principal components, you are able to capture more than 80 percent of the total information, you lose around 20 percent information or slightly less than 20 percent information, but you are able to reduce the dimension of the data from 10 to 4 
or if you use just first two principal components, you are still able to capture around 60 percent of the information and then you can use these first two principal components for multidimensional scaling also. Now, this is the screw plot. So, on x axis you are taking dimensions and on y axis we have taken percentage of uh, explained variances. So, on the basis of first principal component you are able to explain more than 41 percent of the total information. On the basis of second principal component you are able to capture this much of percentage of variance of all information. Then uh, after the four principal components or after six principal components, actually after six principal components it becomes almost flattened. Even after four component principal components, the changes are not much. So, this script plot helps you in selecting the number of principal components to be included without losing much information. Now, here we have calculated cost square for three variables, cost square of three variables on the first four dimensions and these cost square values give you the quality of representation of the variables. Say 100 meter days with dimension 1 has cost square value 0.7236, with dimension 2 it has a very small cost square value, with dimension 3 it has 0.09 cost square value and with dimension 4 it has 0 0.0011 cost square value. So, most of the information has been captured by dimension 1. Similarly, for long jump the cost square value corresponding to dimension 1 is 0 0.6307 and corresponding to all other dimensions it is quite small. Dimension 2 is corresponding to the second principal component, dimension 3 is corresponding to the third principal component and so on. Uh, similarly, for short put the cost square value corresponding to the dimension 1 is 0 0.5386 and then after that it is slightly higher for, with dimension 3. 0.2679. Then you can present all these cost square values using this graph. So, this is the graphical presentation of cost square values. So, with dimension 1 it is quite high, with dimension 2 it is very low, with dimension 3 it is slightly higher, but it is still it is not much. It is, it is then slightly higher with dimension 9, but with all other dimensions it is quite low, negligible. Similarly, long jump has very high cost square value with dimension 1 and it has slightly higher value with dimension 8. With all other dimensions, the values are very low. Short put has a highest cost square value with dimension 1 and uh, then second highest with dimension 3 with the third principal component. Similarly, high jump this has mm, higher cost square value with dimension 1 and then with dimension 2 also. So, this graph gives you 
the cost square values for different sport events with different dimensions. So, interesting thing is for pole vault for 1500 meter this the cost square value corresponding to dimension 2 is much higher than the cost square value corresponding to dimension 1. Then for javelin the cost square value corresponding to dimension 3 is higher than the cost square value corresponding to dimension 1 or dimension 2. So, it is not necessary that all the variables have highest cost square values corresponding to first principal component. But uh, actually this graph uh, provides a good visual display of all these cost square values. Now, suppose you consider bar plot of variables cost square to dimension 1, then you get this graph. So, using this bar plot, you can easily visualize which events have highest cost square values or lower cost square values with dimension 1. Similarly, you can plot bar plot for variables cost square corresponding to dimension 2 or dimension 3 or even corresponding to dimension 10. To get an idea of the contribution of different principal components or how the princ different principal components are actually correlated with different variables. How much principal component one is correlated with uh, the 100 meter race or how much principal component 8 is correlated with 100 meter race. Now, here is the graph of contribution of the variables to the first two principal components. So, contribution of variables to dimension 1. So, on x axis you are taking different variables and on y axis you are taking their contributions. Similarly, in this second graph you are taking contribution of variables to dimension 2. Again on the x axis you have taken all the variables and on the y axis you are taking their contributions. The average contribution has been displayed by this line or this dotted line. These dotted lines give you the average contribution. Now, some of the variables have uh, more than average contribution and some of the variables have lower than the average contribution. So, in dimension 1, which variables have more than average contributions? The first variable 100 meter days or long jump or 110 meter hurdles, discus throw, short put, 400 meter days. On the other hand, 1500 meter this has very small contribution. Pole vault has slightly higher contribution, but it is still it is much smaller than the average contribution. The other events which have a smaller contribution than the average contribution are high jump and javelin throw. So, from this graph you can identify the contribution of different variables or different sporting events which has been captured in dimension 1 
So, not only the total contribution, you can even capture the contribution of each and every event also. Or in this graph, you can capture the contribution of different events, which has been captured by dimension 2. Uh, interesting thing is that, say this 100 meter race has maximum contribution in dimension 1, but it has very low contribution in dimension 2. Similarly, 110 meter race, it has very high contribution in dimension 1, but it has minimum contribution in dimension 2. Pole vault has a very highest contribution in dimension 2, but it has very small contribution in dimension 1. A variable with a contribution which is more than average contribution is important in contributing to that particular component. For instance, the 100 meter race and long jump contribute the most to dimension 1 and pole vault contribute the most to dimension 2. Now, we consider factor map. In factor map, the cos square values are differed by gradient colors. Say, we have used dark orchid for variables with low cos square values, gold for variables with medium cos square values, dark orange for variables with high cos square values and uh, positively correlated variables are grouped and then negative correlated variables are on opposite sides of the plot origin. So, this is the factor map. So, dark orchid denotes the variables with low cos square values and gold color denotes the variables with medium cos square values and dark orange gives variables with high cos square values. So, this one or this one say 100 meter this it has high cos square value, but it is in the negative direction the correlation is in the other direction. Short put, uh, it has medium cos square value or discussed through. Positively correlated, correlated variables are grouped. Say so, these variables which are in one group, they are positively correlated. These two group variables they are negative correlated with the variables on the other side. So, 100 meter this is negative correlated with high jump or pole vault is negative correlated with high jump. Then long jump is negative correlated with 100 meter this. So, uh, this Factor map gives you this kind of information. Uh, actually, in this factor map, we have taken dimension 1 on x axis and dimension 2 on the y axis. And then dimension 1 explains around 41.2 percent of total variation and dimension 2 explains around 18.4 percent of total variation. Then in this graph, we have displayed the performance of individuals or different athletes. Contributions of individuals to principal components 1 and principal component 2 has been displayed in this graph. So, different players are here. Some players are closer to the center 
and some all fall away from the center. So, the athletes Bodhgandan, Massey, Kalpo and Clay, they are close to the circumference of the correlation circle. And this indicates that these athletes have very high cost square values. That is, these athletes have a good representation on the principal components. On the other hand, there are some athletes which are closer to the center, say Yurko, Baras. So, there are some athletes, Yurko, Pogodilev, Baras and Macmillan, who are close to the center of the circle. And these athletes have lowest cost square that is these athletes are not well represented by the first two principal components. We just uh, compare these results with the previously obtained cost square values corresponding to different dimensions also. Now, we consider these three players and we observe that say these three players contribute the most to both the dimensions. So, this is the average contribution and uh, then you are plotting the contribution in percentage for different athletes. So, these three athletes have the maximum contribution. Now, we discuss how we can use PCA in image processing. So, we have considered this particular image. This is the original image. Then we have used R packages JPEG, Factor Extra, Grid Extra, ggplot2, Magic and uh, image uh, IMG PLAR for the principal component analysis of the image. Now, we have taken a color photo which has three matrices pixel by fix, pixel each for one component of RGB means red, green and blue color. And suppose you want to convert that image into grayscale, then you simply sum up the RGB shades and divide it by the maximum value of a scale up to a maximum of 1. So, this is how we have converted this image into the grayscale. And for applying principal component analysis, we run individual PCA on shades R, G and B, giving an eigenvector of shades. Uh, now, this is the scree plot. Even the first principal component is able to explain around 88.6 percent of the variation or it has 88.6 percent of information and then if you combine it with the second principal component, it becomes even more than 90 percent. Similarly, for green color, if we combine the first two principal components, it goes beyond 90 percent. For the blue color also, the first principal component has captured around 85 percent information and then if you combine it with the second principal component or third principal component, it reaches beyond 90 percent. So, this is the original image. Then in the subsequent images, we are adding the principal components one by one. So, as soon as we consider the image 
based on just first principal component, we get this picture, which is of course not very clear. When we add another principal component, so this is the image based on first two principal components. So, it is much more clear than the image based on the only the first principal component. Then when we add one more principal component and form this image, then the picture becomes even much more clear. It is almost as good as the original picture or the original image. So, when we add more and more principal components, the image becomes clearer. So, this is how you can apply principal component analysis for image processing. You can uh, apply the principal component analysis to pixel data and then you consider the principal components one by one and then uh, form the image based on those principal components and then you stop as soon as the picture becomes clear enough. And this is how you can save the space while transmitting an image. So, each color scale RGB gets its matrix and principal component and then we integrate new shades into the picture the image becomes clearer as we increase the number of principal components. So, while applying the principal component analysis, one has to estimate the eigenvalues, eigenvectors and uh, they are from the principal components using the sample observations. So, in this lecture, we have discussed how to estimate the principal components and then uh, we have also discussed different criterion for selecting the number of principal components. Uh, we also considered some of the examples which have been solved using the R software. I am going to stop here. Thank you. Hi, I am Chitwan Lalji, a PhD student of Health Economics under the supervision of Dr. Debian Pakrashi uh, from the Department of Humanities and Social Sciences, IIT Kanpur. In one of my essays, I am interested in understanding the relationship between consumption of fruits and vegetables and various health indicators. Health indicators, both subjective and objective health indicators like mental health, self-assessed health, various measures of blood pressure and various measures of cholesterol. Uh, measures of blood pressure like systolic and diastolic BP, you have your incidence of high BP MAP and incidence of high MAP. And as far as cholesterol is concerned, I have tried to concentrate more on total cholesterol, good cholesterol and incidence of high cholesterol. Now before I go on to what have been my major contributions and various policy implications, I would like to briefly tell you about the policy initiatives of WHO and various countries. The WHO that is the World Health Organization, it started with a campaign of 5 a day. That is you should have 5 portions of fruits and vegetables per day. That would be approximately you could say 400 grams of fruits and vegetables. Now a portion, before we go further, I will just tell you what exactly is a portion. One portion is equivalent to a medium sized apple or one small glass of fruit juice which is approximately 150 milliliters and uh, maybe 3 teaspoons of vegetables. 
So, uh, the WHO went for the five a day campaign, which was further taken up by various countries. Countries like UK, Netherlands, Germany, Norway, they adopted the five a day policy, while some went for expansionary dietary policies like France, Australia, Canada, Denmark. So, for example, Australia, it went for go for two plus five policy in which it said that you should consume five por two portions of fruits and five portions of vegetables per day. And USA went for a policy of fruits and vegetables, more matters. That is, you must consume more and more fruits and vegetables. Now, irrespective of these expansionary dietary policies and dietary propagations, it has been found that only 28% of women and 25% of men they actually meet the recommended dietary norms of five a, five a day portion. So, the major contribution of my work is firstly to find an association between fruits and vegetables, whether there exists a relationship between fruits and vegetables and health indicators. And if they exist, whether if due to heterogeneity in the data, so I will be doing it according to age, by gender and by uh, your weight. So, apart from that, I will go for policy recommendations in which I will, I am basically studying uh, how much fruits and vegetables matter, apart from that, which type matters more. So, for that, I have taken data from the Health Survey of England. Health Survey of England is an annual survey which takes uh, data, which conducts information regularly on demographic and socioeconomic characteristics. You have your lifestyle behaviors like an individual smokes or doesn't smoke, alcohol consumption, you have your sedentary and physical activities and you have various health uh, indicators also which have been collected. Uh, so, uh, before I go on to what exactly is my research, I would like to concentrate more on fruits and vegetables like what kind of questions were asked in the survey. Questions like what kind of fresh fruit do you eat? Did you eat any dried fruit yesterday? Don't count dried fruits in cereals, cakes. Apart from that, for vegetables, they asked how many tablespoons of vegetables did you eat yesterday? So, approximately after this whole survey was conducted, data was converted into portions of fruits. And uh, like for example, three, por three tablespoons of vegetables is equivalent to one portion. So, data was converted and provided to the users, that is us from the UK Data Health Survey. So, the major con con contributions of my paper is that I found a strong negative association between uh, intake of fruits and self-assessed health, then various measures of uh, blood pressure like mean arterial pressure, high mean arterial pressure, high blood pressure, systolic and diastolic BP and your total cholesterol. Apart from that, I have found a strong positive association between consumption of vegetables and good cholesterol. So, it is recommended in a way that if you want to control your blood pressure, you must consume more and more fruits. And as far as vegetables are concerned, they impact your good cholesterol. Apart from that, I went in for a falsification test. A falsification test is basically conducted to know whether the model that you have adopted and the conclusions that you are drawing are not spurious. So, if uh, a falsification test is done to know in a way, it is tested by seeing an indicator, a health indicator which is not being impacted by your consumption of fruits and vegetables. And then see, we see whether there is significant result or not. If there is no significant result, that means your model is good and your results are non-spurious. So, what we did is for falsification test, we took ear complaints and infectious diseases. Now, ear complaints like if you are deaf since birth or you have some kind of imbalance body imbalance that is not being impacted by your post consumption of fruits and vegetables and we did find insignificant results. Apart from that infectious diseases like HIV, A, HIV AIDS, etc., we found similar insignificant results indicating that our, for, uh, that our results are not spurious, non spurious. Apart from that we went uh, since there was a, a lot of heterogeneity in the data like uh, by gender, by age and by weight. We, can, we did the regression analysis. We found results which stated that as far as uh, fruits are concerned, it impacts a male's health more than a female's health. So, it is basically said a, a man should consume more fruits to impact his health whereas 
as far as vegetables are concerned they impact women's health more but this has been only seen as far as cholesterol is concerned the various measures of cholesterol like total cholesterol good cholesterol and your incidence of getting high cholesterol now after this we went in for a policy implication and in the policy implication we found we tried to find two policy implication what matters and exactly how much portion matters so as far as how much portion matters we have found that on an average five or more portions of fruits impact your overall health that is your self assessed health your map your incidence of high map and incidence of high bp but if you want to have a good mental health so you can optimize your mental health by consuming three or four portions of fruits as well and similarly has uh, as far as self assessed health and total cholesterol is concerned an individual must consume four to five portions to optimally have the impact of consumption of fruits apart from that vegetables have had a very little impact on your health it only impacts your incidence of getting high map and high bp and uh, you it's seen that only it impacts when you consume five or more portions of fruits so an optimum consumption of five or more portions of fruits and vegetables are recommended but fruits have a more impact on your overall health on various measures like self assessed health mental health your various measures of blood pressure and various cholesterol levels another thing that we find is which type of fruit matters it has been seen that all size fruits they impact your self assessed health your systolic and diastolic blood pressure your mean arterial pressure your high bp and incidence of getting high map and high cholesterol but we find that uh, as far as frozen fruits or canned fruits are concerned they have a they help in regulating your incidence of getting high map or high bp but it has a trade off that means there is something negative happening it reduces the good cholesterol in your body apart from this it if you ha if you ha have an incidence of getting high cholesterol it is recommended that you must consume fruit juices because it has a impact in reducing your probability of getting high cholesterol and uh, dried fruits they impact your self assessed health as far as vegetables are concerned very little impact has been seen it has only been seen in case of a uh, uh, portion of salads and its association with self assessed health another thing that they have seen is vegetables in composite they have an association with good cholesterol so overall my research basically says that there is an association between consumption of fruits and vegetables and various health indicators and um, it is highly recommended that an individual in order to be healthy must consume five or more portions of fruits and five or more portions of vegetables per day but fruits have a more impact on your overall health apart from that all size fruits they have a better impact on your overall health your mental health various measures of blood pressure and cholesterol so thank you Hello and welcome to this piece of literary snippet. We usually know William Shakespeare as the most revered figure in the history of English literature. But we often tend to forget that he has also been one of the most hated figures in literature. And here I'm not talking only about those boys and girls who have to memorize a long sections from Macbeth or King Lear or Julius Caesar uh, before they can go and sit for their school and or college exams. But I'm also talking about people who are themselves quite famous authors. Tolstoy, for instance, considered the writings of Shakespeare to be, and I quote, crude, immoral, vulgar, and senseless. George Bernard Shaw absolutely loathed Shakespeare, as he did Homer. But perhaps no other criticism about Shakespeare is more damaging than the one which says that Shakespeare is a marvelous storyteller, provided someone has told him the story earlier. Now, this piece of criticism is particularly damaging because it is true. None of Shakespeare's plays contain 
any original story whatsoever. They are all written using pre-existing materials, pre-existing stories. Now, does that diminish the stature of Shakespeare as a dramatist? Well, I'll leave that for you to decide. See you in the next episode of Literary Snippets.